So we, uh, so in this uh, introduction of the sacraments, we've been talking about uh, the sacraments as a power from God that comes forth in Christ. We've been talking about how they're efficacious signs. They actually accomplish something. They make a change that they were instituted by Christ. They came directly from him and that they're entrusted to the church so that we can receive divine life, right? And that the fruit of this uh, sacramental life is that we, as faithful partakers, uh, can share in this divine nature by being in a living union with the only Son, our Savior. Okay, so that's the goal of all the sacraments. And so now we come to uh, the sacraments of service, and we looked at them last week. We looked at the holy orders. Uh, the sacraments of initiation ground us in a common vocation of all of Christ's disciples. So every single baptized person has a vocation of holiness. The idea of we are, we are to become like God, right? We are to, to, to strive with all of our heart and soul and strength to rid ourselves of sin and become uh, people who can love the way God loves. Uh, and to the mission of evangelizing the world. So we become like God and we're to reach out to all of those people that we have relationships with and encounter. And they confer the graces needed for the life according to the Spirit during this life as pilgrims as we march towards our homeland. All right, so these two uh, sacraments, holy orders and matrimony, build on all the other sacraments as, as sacraments of service. And the thing that sets these two sacraments apart is that they're directed towards the salvation of others. So you notice this, the service is, uh, is, is not just like this generic, uh, I want to make you feel better, or I want to do something for you. The, the service is directed towards eternal salvation, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so, so, so everything that's, that's done in these two sacraments, so holy orders and matrimony, is about eternity. Right? And so, we come to our final sacrament. The great mystery. It's almost like a mystery within a mystery, right? Because Paul talks about the mystery of marriage, and we know that the sacraments are mysteries, so it's kind of a mystery mystery of matrimony. <laughs> Say that ten times fast. Anyway, so the catechism begins this section by saying that the matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole life is by its nature ordered towards the good of the spouses and for the procreation and education of offspring. This covenant between baptized persons has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament. And so the, the, the uh, catechism says this, this covenant of bond, this marriage bond that is established between a man and a woman has, it has by its very nature the good of each of the spouses and the good of the children produced, right? Mm -hmm. And that obviously it existed before Christ came along, but now we're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, that Christ, we, you know, we've been saying Christ is the one who gave us the sacraments, and if marriage has been there all along, like when did that happen, right? But there's a very interesting passage in, uh, in Matthew chapter 13 where some Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, uh, they come to him and to test him ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? Now under the Mosaic law, you couldn't divorce your wife for any cause, right? And so they're, they're, uh, they're at, at, actually at this time, uh, just like lots of cultures, when you open the door to divorce, the door gets wider and wider and wider. Mm -hmm. And so at this time, uh, you could apply for a divorce for lots of different reasons other than the ones that were found uh, in Moses' law. And so, uh, so they're testing Jesus, you know, like, are, you know, are, are you uh, going to uphold the Mosaic Law, or are you kind of going to let us have our, <laughs> the way things are? And he answers, and he says, Have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Interesting that he goes back to creation. You'll notice the Catechism talks about creation a lot in this section. He says he made them male and female at the beginning. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, 
but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And then he continues. They said to him, Why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her? And he said to them, It was because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. So you can see, okay, so there's a creation story where there's God's intention that uh, this marriage union, it would be an, a lifelong union, and then because of sin, which we'll explore in a little bit, uh, there's this allowance made. But now, Jesus is saying that that allowance was made, but it's not allowed anymore, right? He's, 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 he's actually um, upping the ante. It's like, no, 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 we're going to go back to what was originally intended. And that's exactly what we're going to discover the sacrament of marriage is really all about, right? Because you notice, in all of these sacraments, there is this restoration taking place, right? Mankind falls into sin, and he's separated from God, and he's affected by sin, and so the sacrament of baptism cleanses us from original sin and provides forgiveness and, and, and instills in us the divine life. And then, in confirmation, we receive the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit's power to be able to live the Christian life in such a way that it's a joyful, peaceful witness to the world. Right? And then, of course, in the Eucharist, we receive Christ's life, Christ being himself into us so that we become little Christs. I mean, that is, the, uh, I mean, <laughs> that is even greater than the original creation. And then ways of restoring us when sin affects us with reconciliation and the anointing of the sick. And now, in this uh, sacrament, is the restoration of the creative order. Okay? Pretty exciting stuff. So it says, Sacred Scripture begins with the creation of man and women, man and woman, in the image and likeness of God, and concludes with a vision of the wedding feast of the Lamb. And so what the Catechism is saying is like the Scripture starts with marriage in the Garden of Eden, and it ends with marriage in the book of Revelation when the church becomes the bride of Christ. And everywhere in between, there is this thread that runs through it, right? There's a, uh, you find it in the Song of Solomon, where there's the love story between a king and a peasant, and then you find it again in the book of Hosea, who's a prophet who goes and uh, God tells him, go and marry a prostitute. <laughs> and, uh, and so there's this story where it's a reflection of God's love for his people and how unfaithful the people are. And, uh, and, so you, and, and then, of course, when you get to the New Testament, all the way through the Gospels, Jesus is always saying, I'm the bridegroom, right? And he's telling stories about, it's like, uh, you know, the, the, the bridegroom's away and the virgins are coming out to meet him, or it's like, the, you know, it has all of these images. And then, of course, in the Apostles' writing, the, the bride of Christ, the church, begins to be more clearly defined. And then when you get to the book of Revelation, it says when we arrive in heaven and all, everything's all done, the judgment seat is all over, uh, everything is complete, that we sit down to this feast. And it's the wedding feast of the Lamb. Right? And so this image of marriage is, goes all the way through the scriptures and is uh, it, it, it's rooted in who we are and how we're created, but it's also manifested in us becoming the bride of Christ. So it says God himself is the author of marriage. He's the one that came up with the idea. Right? It's his idea. It's not man's idea. Um, it's kind of funny that if you look at societies, that, that the further away that they get from God, the less that marriage matters. <laughs> right? You just look, you know, you look at our culture, and, and uh, it's just like, well, why would you get married? Right? I mean, like, unless there's some sort of financial advantage to it, but most of the time the financial advantage is actually not being married. <laughs> and so, uh, so this is the idea, and this is a really uh, important idea, is that, uh, that God is the one who came up with this idea. And it says that the well-being of the individual person 
and of both the human and Christian societies is closely bound up with the healthy state of the conjugal and family life. So again, the Catechism is, is reaffirming this idea that the best thing for individuals and the best thing for culture, whether it's a Christian culture or a secular culture, is a healthy married and family life. Right? And, and that uh, they are closely bound up together. So that if uh, family life is not doing well, then the individual isn't doing well, and the culture isn't doing well. Right? And so, so this idea, this marriage stuff, is really important to get right. It's interesting that there's a ton of studies for this too, that uh, married people are healthier, they live longer, they're more sexually satisfied, they're more, you know, I mean, like there's just a ton of studies that show married life is actually better for us than any other life choice we could make. It's kind of interesting. And then, if you look at uh, studies of children being successful and uh, dealing with anxiety and depression and all of those types of issues, the children of married couples who actually have their own father and mother in their home, which is getting more and more rare. Over half the kids in public school now are not living with their parents, mm -hmm. right? Which is kind of shocking and, and sad because uh, some of you probably know from personal experience, uh, but certainly, scientifically speaking, divorce is devastating for children. Now, children are incredibly resilient, and so it doesn't mean that there's no hope for them, uh, that, but that uh, it does have profound effects on them. And if you look scientifically, then they're more likely to uh, not be successful in school or not likely to be successful in relationships and have issues with trust or have issues with substance abuse, and all of those things, right? So the very best thing for individuals and the very best thing for families and children is for marriage to work <laughs> because that was the plan, right? So it says, the vocation to marriage is written into the very nature of man and women, man and woman, as they come from the hand of the Creator. Marriage is not purely a human institution. So this idea that this, this uh, the idea of marriage is written into our very nature. It's part of our being, right? And it says, God, God who created man out of love, also calls him to love the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. Kind of interesting. This fundamental vocation of every single human being is to love. What a profound idea that is all by itself, right? That we were created by love to love. So, so I want to take a couple of minutes because you, um, you know, it's obvious that that almost every paragraph that we've seen so far, and in lots of the paragraphs we're going to see in a couple of minutes, all have to do with creation, right? And so I want to go back and think about this idea of creation, and especially thinking about it in terms of or in light of uh, John Paul II's um, series of um, uh, lectures that he gave. That, that were compiled, and, and now they're called the Theology of the Body. Now, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Theology of the Body. Some of you, okay, good. So they're meditations on Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And, and so if you just uh, think about this story, and we don't have time to go back and read it, but uh, of course, we know from the Catechism, and, and we've talked about this a lot, that uh, this the God who is infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. Right? And so you have the Trinity. Uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This explosion of love. This, this community of persons who are uh, constantly pouring out uh, themselves to each other in love. Right? The Father is pouring out all that he is and all that he has in love for the Son, and the Son is pouring out all that he is and all that he has in love for the Father, in the Spirit, and that is the Trinitarian life. And it is such an amazing and wonderful life that 
they decide they want to create us, human beings, to be able to enter into that very existence, right? And so, so you know the creation story. You know that, uh, that God created Adam from the dust of the earth, and he breathed into him. So Adam, uh, unlike all the rest of creation, which is just spoken into existence, right? Adam is formed and breathed in. And so he is this unique combination of matter, right? And spirit. And, and remember the story where God tells him to name all the animals and they have this encounter where, you know, where all the animals are brought to Adam and he names them all. And it says that Adam was not able to find a suitable mate, right? With every animal, I mean, like, as delightful as all those animals were and as much fun as that would have been to name them, uh, there was a sense when, he, when he's all done, this sense of loneliness is like, none of these are like me, right? <laughs> not, like, there's, there's, they, they are all creatures. They don't have the, the, the spiritual, the intellectual, the reasonable, right? The, the ability to sacrifice themselves in love for each other. They're just... I mean, they're playful and they're fun and all of that stuff. <laughs> but they're not me. They're not like me. And so, and so God puts him into a deep sleep, right? And draws Eve from his side. Now, you got to remember, there's two creation stories, right? And the first creation story is kind of the cosmic one. And the second creation story is more intimate, right? Which is kind of interesting because there's two different names of God used. And, and, and that's a specific, those are, those are meant to mirror each other, right? So in the first one, it says uh, that you have this conversation going on between God and himself, because he says, let us make man in our image. Those are plural words, right? So either the Father's talking to the Son, the Son's talking to the Father. I mean, like, there's this conversation going on in the Trinity. Let us make man in our image, Male and female, he created them. Which is very interesting, right? Because it says that this maleness and femaleness isn't just an accident, but it says it's, it's in our maleness and femaleness that we image God. So in the second story, now Eve is drawn from the side of Adam, and Adam, for the first time, speaks, right? He hasn't spoken yet in this creation story, and the first time, he actually, you know, like, is expressing this joyful exuberation of, like, oh my gosh, you're like, this is a, a person like me, a reflection of me, a completeness of who I am. And it says this interesting passage that says, they were naked and not ashamed. <laughs> and, of course, the idea there is that they are without sin at this point, right? And so God presents them to each other, and they have no fear. They have no shame. They don't have to worry about this person being selfish and hurting them. They don't have to worry about uh, anger. They don't have to worry about, you know, like uh, 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 any of those things. They can give themselves completely to the other person without any fear of getting hurt, without any fear of being rejected, without any fear of being shamed, right? They can give themselves completely in love to that other person. And of course, this is expressed uh, in their bodies. And John Paul II talked about the idea that, you know, like a man's body all by itself doesn't make sense, right? And a female body doesn't make sense all by itself. But when you see them together, and uh, then, then it makes sense. These things belong together, right? They, that's part of the creation. They're created to be together. And so, uh, John Paul talks about this idea that we are created for relationships. We are created specifically for marriage. Okay, so, he, so then, of course, you, you, you think about it. This is not in the biblical story. But you think about it, what happens then, right, is that these two eternal spiritual physical human beings uh, in complete innocent and fullness of love for each other without any fear or shame or any kind of danger come together in a sexual union and in that sexual union 
they're able to produce another human being, another eternal spiritual, physical being. And in that moment of conception, you, it, it's really fascinating to think about. Like, I, I think someday I'd love to teach a class that, it, 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 uh, or a seminar that would be like God, science, and the Catholic Church, right? <laughs> because now that we know what we know about science, we have this whole the DNA stuff, right? And so each one of us has this unique, you know, the uniqueness of our fingerprints, the uniqueness of who we are. We get that from our DNA, right? Which is just this uh, profound, you know, you know, just looking. DNA is just amazing, right? It has, it, it has more information in it than we could ever come up with. Like it's, you know, I, 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 it's just amazing. The instructions for your entire human body for all of your life are in this little string of invisible proteins, right? And, and so, you have this DNA, it's, it's like it makes you who you are. But of course, uh, in the sexual union, my DNA and my wife's DNA gets mixed up to create this brand new individual human being. And so these physical instructions come together, and at that moment, the, the, the scriptures and the catechism say, God creates a unique human soul. Now, and the soul that's created in the sexual union lasts forever, right? See, that's, that's one of the things that I think we have a problem with, is like, we're so locked into time, right? Like, we, it's kind of like time is all we know, it's all that we experience. And, but, this, but the idea is like, no, no, like, time is just like this little tiny thing, and eternity is this huge thing. That's where our, our destiny is, that's what we're really created for, that's where we're going to live forever. And, and that we have an opportunity, a crazy, amazing opportunity, to create this weird mixture of husband and wife, an eternal human being that I'm going to share eternity with. Which means that if you think about it, that every sexual union means that that you know that, that there's angels there, right? Which is kind of you know, I mean, they don't just like, oh, what, what's going on? We should go downstairs for a few minutes, right? <laughs> right? No, there are guardian angels. They're, they're you know they're there all the time. So there's angels there, but it also means that God is there because he is about to create something that has never existed before. It is a continuation of creation. It is the only thing like this in all of the world, in all of history. No one else can make it. No one else can do this, right? And so, you know, the church is always talking about the sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of sex. And it's just like, that's because it is incredibly holy what can happen there. What is happening and what can happen, right? And so you have Adam and Eve in their perfect sinlessness, uh, sharing in this incredible experience of profound uh, love for each other and, and, uh, and the potential and eventually the realization of creating more amazing eternal human beings. And, and of course, you know, you could think about, uh, you, know, you know, I got my DNA from my parents and they got it from their parents. And so, you know, if, 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 you're, a, if you're a parent, then you're really proud of your children, you're, you know, grandparents. And it's like, oh, my grandparents. I can remember my mom when she was, uh, she was 89 when she died saying, you know, we had five children, we have 12 grandchildren, we got 15 great grandchildren. <laughs> you know, it's like this, this lineage, right? And because we're uh, we're so locked into time, we think, well, you know, like like I knew my great my grandfather, like I didn't know my great grandfather, but my great grandfather knows me, right? He's still he's still alive. He's part of the communion of saints if if he had faith. And and his father, I mean, like it's not any different except that you know, like uh, you know, the ones that lived two thousand years ago say, you know. I had five children, and I had 12 grandchildren, and I've got 49,000 great, great, great grandchildren, <laughs> right? It's this connection. It's this family connection that gets spread through all of creation. And the cool thing is that when we get to eternity, we're reunited with our families. 
right? Where we enter into these relationships. See that that's part of this whole, you know, the you know, the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit is just this, this love relationship, and all of us are going to enter into that. So I'm going to be able to meet my great 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 grandparents and discover it's because of them that this whole family exists and how amazing and beautiful that is. It's funny, now that we're old, uh, Hollis and I look back at our lives, and we don't have very many regrets because we've worked really hard to make good decisions, uh, but one of the regrets that we have, the biggest regret that we have, is that we didn't have more children. Because we look at our grown-up children, and we look at their children, and we think, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. How did these amazing human beings come to be, right? And look, they're making more human beings, and, and they're, the human beings they're making are so amazing. It's like, wouldn't it be cool to have twice as many, right? <laughs> See, the scriptures, all the way through the scriptures, children are seen as this gift from God, this tremendous gift. And lots of times in our modern culture, we see children as a burden, right? Mm -hmm. or, or an inconvenience, or something difficult, or, you know, all of those things. You don't get that at all from the scriptures. Every scripture about children throughout the entire Bible is what a tremendous gift they are. Interesting, isn't it? Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, yeah, it's even to the point where kids are, are being seen as threats, you know, threats to the, to the planet. Yeah, you know, that's right. It's really something. Yeah. Bad, bad state of the world. And so, so, so then, of course, we all know the story. Adam and Eve, in this perfect union, uh, decide to disobey God. They're profoundly affected, and a very, a, you know, the very first thing that they realize is that, oh my gosh, I'm vulnerable. I'm naked. And and it's interesting that the first thing they cover over is their sexual parts, right? <laughs> and and what they're, uh, you know, what they what they realize is, I can be taken advantage of now. I can be hurt. I can be used, right? I can. Like this other, I can't trust this other person now. And, and of course, when you look through the history of human relationships after the fall, we see tons of pain, right? And tons of broken relationships, tons of broken families, tons of bad choices as a result of the pain and fear. And so uh, we come to the New Testament, and, uh, and the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, listen, uh, you know, this marriage stuff doesn't seem to work very good. <laughs> so, you know, we should... We should, we should, like, you know, let, let people uh, divorce more, right? And Jesus says, no, 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 that's not the plan. That's not the plan at all. Because there's something so much more profound and amazing going on in marriage. It's not just this, uh, this little union between the man and the wife, which is really profound and amazing. It's not just the fact that they can produce children, eternal human beings, which is really amazing. But there's something... Even beyond that, with marriage, that makes it even holier than it would seem from the things that we've seen already. I just started reading a really good book by Cardinal Sarah, who's a, a cardinal from Africa, and, uh, and it's called um, the, the Day is Far Spent, and he's reflecting on especially Western culture, because the, the Catholic Church in Africa is doing really well. Uh, it has, it is uh, doubled, in some areas, tripled in the last 30 years. Uh, that, uh, in, you know, Nigeria, the reason why we have so many Nigerian priests here in Maine is because they have more priests than they know what to do with. Uh, and so they send them to us as missionaries because uh, they, they don't have a priest shortage at all. <laughs> right? And so, uh, so this cardinal is looking at Western culture, and he's, and he's uh, reflecting on the fact that the Western culture in the West, the church is collapsing, Europe and North America, the church is just collapsing seriously. And so he makes these reflections, and one of his observations that I thought was really fascinating is that the West has lost its ability to, to stand in wonder, in wonder, in, in awe, right? And so he talks about you know, the, that, that we should tremble before the Blessed Sacrament, and that we should be awestruck when we see a nativity. That, you know, like this idea that like these are such profound and amazing mysteries that we just take for granted. And of course, 
when it comes to marriage and sexuality, we have completely lost our wonder and our awe of what that really is. And so, <laughs> Ed Shree is, uh, has this, um, these reflections based on the theology of the body, and I like some of his quotes, so I use them. He says, human persons are made for self-giving love. We are made in the image of God, uh, and, and that whole, the whole point of the Trinity is that they're pouring out their love and life for each other and to each other, and in marriage we are created so that we can do that with our spouse. <clears throat> we are made for self-giving love, not a self-getting love. And human persons will find fulfillment only when they give themselves in service to others. Which makes sense, right? If I'm created to love and to give myself away in love, the only way I'm going to find fulfillment is when I am doing what I'm created for. And so the Catechism says, man is created in the image and likeness of God who is himself love. So I, I hope, you, you know, like you're getting this message, right? I'm created to love. And so God provides this amazing and beautiful relationship and covenant called marriage so that I can devote myself to this thing that I'm created for, which is to pour myself out in, in sacrificial love for another person. <laughs> Since God exists as a communion of three divine persons, this is Ed Shree again, by the way. Since God exists as a communion of three divine persons giving themselves completely in love to each other, man and woman, created in the image of the Trinity, are made to live not as isolated individuals, each seeking his or her pleasure or advantage from each other. Rather, man and women are made to live in an intimate, personal communion of self-giving love, mirroring the inner life of the Trinity. Imaging the inner life of the Trinity. In the end, human persons will find the happiness they long for when they learn to live like the Trinity, giving themselves in love to others. <laughs> so do you, do you see the creation there? Like, let us make man in our image, and it's when we uh, are imaging that love that we fulfill uh, who we are as human beings. And so this idea of, of our marriages being an image of the love that the Father has for the Son and the Son has for the Father and the Spirit, then, uh, then you, you realize, like, wow, this is a, this is a pretty high calling, <laughs> right? Go ahead. I just want to, could, could you turn the slide back on, please? Sure, I can. Uh, so I can, and I can send you a link to this uh, <laughs> paper that Ed Shree wrote. You all set? Okay, thank you. And so the catechism goes on. It says, since God created him, man and woman, their mutual love becomes an image of the absolute and unfailing love with which God loves man. And so, so, you, so again, you have this image, right? This imaging of the Trinitarian love and the image of God's love for us. And so it says, like, in this, in this love relationship, in this marriage relationship, people should look at how I love my wife and say, that's how God loves me. They should be able to look at how my wife loves me and be able to say, that's how much God loves me. See, the marriage is meant to be a sign, a symbol, kind of like a small s sacrament, right? That, uh, uh, that points to something, and what it points to is God's love for us. That's how, you know, like, you know, with, with children being raised with their parents, they're supposed to have a sense of the Father's love for them through the image of their parents' love for them. Right? Yeah. And, and also, of course, through the, the love that the parents share. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, it's just the, the idea of you know, the best way to love uh, your, your kids is, is 
to love your wife or, or, or love your husband, that that's that even yeah. that means so much. Yeah. You know, Mother Teresa used to say, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. <laughs> right? <clears throat> and so you think about uh, this idea of a sign or a symbol. Now, we know from our studying of the scriptures and the catechism that, that God makes these types, right? And so things happen in the Old Testament, and they're images for something that's going to happen and find their fulfillment in Christ, right? And so you have, you know, uh, uh, Abraham offering Isaac. And there's all these parallels that you, you know, like when it's fulfilled, you can look at it and say, oh my gosh, that's what that was, right? And so what, what the catechism is saying here is like, our marriages are like that. Our, you can't see the fulfillment of it right now, but, but when, when we reach the fulfillment of it at the wedding feast of the Lamb, we're going to be able to look back and say, oh, yeah, that's what this was pointing towards, right? That's what that's a sign of. But the interesting thing is, there's a, there's a really fascinating story in the Old Testament where, uh, oh, I just advanced, I didn't need to, <clears throat> where, where God is, uh, is, is with Moses and the people in the wilderness. And, and remember, there's two stories where they run out of water, right? And the first time they run out of water, uh, there's this rock there, and, and God tells Moses, strike the rock with your rod. And water will come forth from it. And so uh, Moses goes and he strikes the rock and water comes out. Paul tells us when we get to the New Testament that the rock is Christ. Right? And the idea is that Christ would uh, be struck on our behalf and that the water that flowed from him was for our salvation. Right? That we're in this desert, can't survive without water. The only hope is that there's water that comes to us and that Christ provides us with the waters of salvation and baptism. So later on, they're traveling through the wilderness and they run out of water again, and there's a rock. And Paul actually says, the rock followed them through the wilderness, which is kind of a funny thing to say, right? I don't know how that happened. But there's the rock. And, and God says to Moses, speak to the rock, and water will come forth. Now, the people had been uh, really in bad moods running out of water, and they'd been blaming Moses and saying, why did you bring us out here? You're trying to kill us. And Moses isn't very happy with them. And instead of obeying God and speaking to the rock, he goes over and strikes it. The water still comes forth. People are still watered. But God isn't very happy. <laughs> right? In fact, when you look at that, it's kind of... It's, Unless you, unless you look at it in terms of the New Testament, it's like, this doesn't make any sense at all. Because what God says to Moses at that point is, because you disobeyed me, you can't enter the promised land. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, I went down there, I did all these miracles, led people out through dry land, went to Mount Sinai, got the Ten Commandments, like, you know, like, like saw you face to face, I'm your best friend, you said that, <laughs> right? Now you're not going to let me have rock because I hit the rock instead of speaking to it. But, but Christ, there's only one sacrifice, right? And, and so this idea of like you, the rock only gets struck once. And then after the rock is struck, you speak to it, right? So there's imagery there. There's a type there of the gospel being proclaimed after the sacrifice of Christ. And Moses messes it up. <laughs> right? Now, Moses doesn't know, right? That Moses doesn't understand that like, oh, God's doing this eternal thing, and when we get to the New Testament, it's going to be really awesome, right? He just knows God says, like, speak to it, don't hit it. Well, in the very same way, we find ourselves in marriages, and God says, right, stay married. You know, here's, here's some guidelines around marriage. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Be submissive one to another. Forgive one another as you have been forgiven. And we think, oh, he's just telling us what to do. And, 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 and I think that part of what this is saying with this, this imaging is saying, no, no, no. Like, your marriage is manifesting and demonstrating God's love. And it's, and it's when it's most difficult, right? 
when it's when it's the almost impossible to love that other person is when it's actually manifested the most. Because what is it? The absolute and unfailing love that God gives to us. I don't deserve God's love, right? There's times when he should get really sick of, you know, I mean, like, well, I, I, you know, you go to confession and you go to confession and you go to and you confess the same things over and over and over, right? But like, shouldn't there be a time where you say, okay, I'm sick of hearing it. <laughs> like, right? I'm done with that. No more forgiveness for that one. <laughs> but no, it's unfailing. There's nothing I could ever do to be not loved by God. And what God is saying is, marriage is supposed to be an image of that. And we all know, right, I think somewhere inside we have this, this archetypal thing where it's like, you know, a sacrificial love. You know, when you see people who have loved each other, everyone's in this, you see, like this picture, like, they've been married 75 years. And it's like, oh my God, that's so cool, right? Or, or you see, and uh, I, well, yeah, I had a, a friend when I was in high school, uh, her name was Linda. She's just a beautiful girl, right, like model type of girl. So, of course, everybody's infatuated with her, right? And, uh, and so... She, uh, you know, she goes to college, she meets this guy, he's a, you know, of course he's handsome and successful, and he starts his own business and makes tons of money, and, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're, you know, like this little dream life. Until when she's uh, in her late 20s, she's diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And within just a few years, is in a wheelchair. And, and, you, and you know, I could imagine, being a powerful, successful businessman, it would have been convenient, for him to kind of like, like, well, I don't have time for this, right? And, and by the way, I want to have a family. But but one of the really cool things is that he took an earlier time. He sold his he sold his business, took an early retirement, so that he could be her full time caregiver. Mm -hmm. And he took care of her for over twenty years. And there's a you know there's a you look at that and you're like, oh my gosh, that is so beautiful, right? That is so amazing. That is such an image of God's love for us that I am, I am, you know, confined by my weaknesses and my frailties, and, and I need constant care and attention. And that is exactly what God provides for me. And I can see it here in this human relationship, right? Or we had, I had some friends once whose uh, whose husband had. Uh, substance abuse problems, and uh, in one of his uh, drunken uh, episodes, he uh, had an affair. And then uh, later on, he uh, went to AA, and he worked really hard, and he got his life together, and it wasn't until, uh, and his wife, even in his drinking days, didn't leave him, uh, and then uh, it was discovered that he had a child <laughs> with this affair that he had. And you'd think, I mean, like, obviously you're talking a tremendous amount of pain for that woman, right? Tremendous amount of pain with having an alcoholic husband, having him be unfaithful, and then having it, you know, years later come back in the form of a child. But this, I can still remember this woman being so gracious of, like, you have a son? I want to meet him. <laughs> right? She's like, you know, like, like that, you know, like, I've completely forgiven you for that. And now, there's this other human being that's part of our family, right? And I can remember thinking, it's like, wow, that is, that is supernatural, right? That is not just this woman being nice. <laughs> that is supernatural. And again, you look at it and think, wow, that's how much God loves me, right? God loves me even when I make really stupid decisions, and those decisions affect all the people that I love in really negative ways, and they have consequences that go out into the future, it doesn't change God's love for me. How, how crazy is that, right? That God has elevated this, this relationship to the point where he says, no, but I want people to be able to see how much I love them through your marriage. So it goes on, and of course this is a, a quote from uh, St. Paul in Ephesians, 
uh, he's talking about husbands and wives and how to get along and forgiveness and submitting one to the other. And then he says, uh, he quotes Genesis and says, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he's, he, he completely stops. It's almost like he has this transition, like he's like giving this practical advice to husbands and wives, and then he stops and says, this is a great mystery and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. Because the image isn't just of God's love for us as individuals, right? But it's the image of, of the, the accomplishment of the ages when we become the bride of Christ. And so... <clears throat> The early church fathers saw in the creation story this, this typology that we've been talking about. And so when, when they see this story of Eve being drawn forth from Adam's side to become his bride, uh, the early church fathers looked at that and said, that's what happened at the cross, right? That, that as, as Christ was dying on the cross, his side gets pierced. And what comes out of his side is the blood and water, which of course we see as the water of baptism and the blood of the Eucharist, his very life, right, which is going to give birth to his bride. And then the early church fathers go through this thread that we talked about that goes through all the scriptures. And they say, oh my goodness, the Song of Solomon, that's uh, that's God's love for us. He's the king and we're the peasants. And they look at Hosea and they say, look, yeah, we're the, we're the unfaithful ones. We're the ones who chase after other gods and yet he still wants to be married to us. We're the ones, right, who are called to be in this intimate, personal, vulnerable, completely naked relationship with God himself. And so that's the, the image of it all, and so of course, as a result of the fall, that image is pretty badly marred, right? Horribly marred. And so when you come to the effects of matrimony, because remember, sacraments have, have to do with power, right? The, the grace proper to the sacrament of matrimony is intended to perfect the couple's love. To strengthen the indissoluble unity. By this grace, they help one another to attain holiness in their married life and in the welcoming and education of their children. So the power of the sacrament, the grace of the sacrament, is to help us perfect our love. See, because I cannot love my wife unconditionally. Human love is conditioned. You make me happy, I'll love you, right? <laughs> you, you, you make choices that, that don't make me happy, then it makes it really hard for me to love you, right? And yet I'm called, right? This, this is like, okay, I'm supposed to, how am I supposed to manifest God's love with this person that I'm, I don't even particularly like right now, right? <laughs> How am I going to image perfect, unconditional love except that I have grace? That is the restoration. You know, the image is terribly marred because of sin, and so God gives us this sacrament, the power. And the power is to restore the image of his love that is supposed to be manifested. So the grace is to perfect the couple's love and strengthen their bond, their unity. And that, you know, remember, going back to Christ's words, he said, let what God has joined together, right? So it's not just a human joining. There is something God does to join them together in the sacrament that's kind of like super glue, right? <laughs> so that they literally become one. In fact, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's talking about divorce and remarriage, and he says, if a believer is married to an unbeliever, they should stay married if they can, 
because the unbeliever is saved by their union with the believer. It's sort of like they are one, right? In, in this union, in this marriage, they are one. And so if one of them is going to heaven, <laughs> guess what, right? The other one's going to get dragged along. That's kind of what Paul is saying. All right, I don't know how that works. I don't know if you like the theology around all of that. But there's a real, genuine, authentic union that God makes with this sacrament. He goes, it goes on in the next paragraph. It says, Christ dwells with them. Gives them the strength to take up their crosses. So, you, so for those of you who are married, uh, like, you know, your spouse is, is one of the crosses, <laughs> right? Like, you have to, there's this huge sacrifice that you are making, right? There's a sacrifice you have to make. And, and it says, and so to follow him and to rise up again after they have fallen. In other words, sin is still going to affect us, right? It's still going to affect our marriages. We're going to have arguments. We're going to have disagreements. We're going to fall from the image. But it says, part of the grace is that we'll be able to rise up after we've fallen and to be able to forgive one another and to be able to bear one another's burdens and to be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. This laying down, this becoming a servant. So that when I get this wonderful idea and I go to all of them, oh my gosh, I had this great idea, I think we should do this. And she's like, I think that's a stupid idea. That, <laughs> right? I have a choice. Right? I can be subject one to another. Right? And so I, so I, it's like, well, if you don't read it, if you really don't think it's a good idea, right? Well, then I, I, I won't do it. Because I am subject. We are one. We have one life. I always say, what do you think about for a while? <laughs> <laughs> so the catechism goes on. It says to love one another and to love one another. This is a continuation of the grace, right? And to love one another with supernatural, that's God's love, mm -hmm. tender and fruitful love. In the joys of their love and family life, he gives them here on earth a foretaste of the wedding feast of the Lamb. So what he's, so what the catechism is saying here is like, okay, so uh, uh, this marriage, this relationship is going to be marred by sin. It's going to be really difficult for us because we all have sinful natures. We're all selfish. We're all want to defend ourselves. We're all influenced by fear and shame. And so God gives me this other person. And part of uh, that giving me this other person is so that I can learn not to be selfish, right? I can learn to overcome my fear and my shame so that I can truly love, where I can die to myself and, and demonstrate God's love for this other person. If any of you ever watched the Beloved series, it's a series on, uh, on form, and it's uh, put out by the Augustine Institute, and it's a 12-part series or a 10-part series on marriage. And the first three or four, or maybe even five, are all about the theology of marriage, which is, of course, what we're talking about now, all this amazing and beautiful stuff. And there's a wonderful story in there about uh, this young couple they dated uh, for many, many years. Uh, he was a Catholic and came from a Catholic family, and he's dating this girl, and, and, uh, and you know the family loves her, and it's sort of like obvious that they should get married. And, uh, and the Catholic family decides that they're going to go on vacation to the Holy Land. The whole family's going. And so they invite this girl to join them. Because she's kind of part of the family already. And so when they, uh, so when they get there, and they're, they're, they go to visit Cana, which of course is the, the place where Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding. Uh, and so there's this you know, little rumor in the family, like, we get to Cana, right? This is all about marriage, and it's, you know, it's, you know, it's part of, like, everybody renews their wedding vows there and all this stuff. It's like, he's going to propose to her when we get to Cana. How much you want it back? He's going to pop the question in Cana, because that's the most romantic place to do it, right? <laughs> but he doesn't do it, and so they're sort of like, well, I guess he's not ready yet, you know? And so they're finishing up their trip, and at the end of their trip, they're visiting Calvary. And they go and visit the place where Jesus is crucified. And when they get to the place where Jesus is crucified, 
this young man goes down on one knee and says, I want to give you, I want to lay down my life so that you can know God's love for you. Will you be my wife? And to me, that was just like, wow, like, he understands what this is, right? I want to lay down my white life the way Christ laid down his life to show his love for us. I want to lay down my life for you to show you how much I love you. It's pretty amazing. And of course, there are moments in the midst of all of that stuff, right? Those beautiful moments where, you, where there is this joy, right? Whether it's with your spouse, or whether it's with your kids, or whether it's with your grandkids, these moments of tremendous joy that you wouldn't trade for anything. And the Catechism says, that's just a little taste, it's a little foretaste. That, that, that moment of joy, you know, when the baby's giggling and laughing, or, you know, whatever it is, that moment of joy, just a little tiny foretaste of what we're going to experience for all of eternity, this wedding feast that we're going to be going to. And so the, the uh, catechism ends with um, this section on this, the practicalities of marriage. And so it says, conjugal love involves a totality in which all the elements of the person enter, the appeal of the body and instinct the power of feeling and affectivity, the aspiration of the spirit and will, it aims at a deeply personal unity. A unity that beyond union in one flesh leads to the forming of one heart and one soul. It demands indissolubility. In other words, like if, you, if you're going to have this deeply personal union that is this union of heart and soul, then you have to know this person's committed to me for the rest of my life. I, like, I don't have to hide anything, right? Like, I, I don't have to pretend I'm something I'm not so that they don't, that they might not stop loving me, right? It's like, no, no, no that, this commitment is for life. And so on my bad days, uh, that, that commitment's still there. And it goes on, it demands indissolubility and obviously faithfulness to the covenant in a definitive mutual giving. Because, of course, if you're unfaithful, then that image certainly gets marred, right? And it is open to fertility. And again, this idea that when you see it for what it really is, that the, a child is the product of the love, the giving of each other, of the husband and wife, and this fascinating and amazing new creation that takes place, and how uh, that, the potential of that in every sexual act is literally affects eternity. That if we knew what was happening in regards to fertility, if we knew what was happening in regards to this creation of a new human being, then contraception would not even be an option, right? It would sort of be like, why would you want to stop God from creating this unique, e eternal human being with a combination of us, right? And so, so this the the image of uh, of of what the church is is painting. You can see it's just like, oh my gosh, this is the fulfillment of all our human desires, right? It's that we want love like this, and we want to be able to give like like love like this. We want to have an influence in eternity. We want to have you know like how our lives matter. We want to have our acts matter, and that when you uh, separate yourself from this then basically we become more like animals, where it's like it doesn't really matter what I decide, it doesn't really matter what I do, it doesn't matter what I do with my body. None of my choices matter. What difference does it make? 
And so, you know, the, the often the church is looked at like, oh, you have all these rules, you know, like no sex outside of marriage, and you can't get divorced, and, you know, contraception, you know, oh, you guys are like dinosaurs, <laughs> you need to modernize, and it's like, no, no, what we need to do is to teach the faith. Because I think if we could teach the faith in, in the reality, and I think I've done a horrible job today, because uh, it doesn't even begin to reflect, I think, the power and beauty and majesty of being male and female, and the power of being able to demonstrate and manifest the actual life of the Trinity, and the love that God has for us in this human way that could communicate it to other people and create more human beings, more eternal beings. Only one more slide, no pronounce. And so, the world sees the church in a certain way, and our calling is primarily the, the most important thing that we can do is to the images of his love. It's the most important thing because that's what we're created for. And it's the thing that is going to find its ultimate fulfillment in eternity when we enter into the life that God has created for us. So I hope this uh, inspires you to, to wonder to stand in awe of who you are as a human being and, and what your relationships, your marriages, your children, your grandchildren, and uh, parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and all that that signifies when you think about the family of God and life.